All right, well, uh, thank you, I'm uh, Mohammed Gidawi. I told I have uh, 10 minutes to set the stage, so I'll uh, try to do that. Uh, what I will do is try to tell you what the challenges are for this water supply system, at least the way I see them, and how uh, Dr. Blocker's talk and some of my research fits in into those challenges. So that's what I'd like to uh, go through in the next uh, 10 minutes. I don't, water supply system are essentially our life support systems really, uh, so therefore it's no surprise that the US Academy of Engineers chose it as one of the greatest achievement of the 20th century. In fact, it ranked number four, okay? And uh, so the question is, how are we now, at least in today's lenses, the way we see them today, right? Because the, the way they view them is how it brought in cities, how it brought in livelihood to cities and so on. But now we tend to view these systems in a different way. I must report that not all, but most systems worldwide, if we think around the world, they are in pretty bad shape. More than 30% of their water and energy is waste. I emphasize here energy. Every time you lose water, you're losing energy. You have to treat the water, you have to pump the water. And that tends to be forgotten in the accountancy business that we are only losing water. Uh, monetarily speaking, if you like money, we are in Hong Kong, uh, the World Bank estimates about $20 billion of direct cost. That's direct, not indirect cost. Just the value of the money and the resources that goes into it. Uh, in terms of volume, that's enough to supply 150 cities like Hong Kong. Right? So if we save that, we don't really need to go run around and create new resources or dig or desalinate water so quickly. So we just need to be a bit more clever with this. Added to this, the stresses that's gonna come in on this by climate change. Now, another interesting thing is what we used to think as resiliency turns out maybe not so resilient. And I think Dr. Blocker will tell us more about that. The, Lots of our designs in the old days for this water supply system are governed by fire flows. Fire needs a lot of diameter. You need to make the pipe so big to fight fires. Fires don't happen that, quick, that often, but when they happen, you need to be ready. But what it means with big pipes, the speed is very small, and that means depositions. So what is turning out is you end up with pipes like this, and you end up with uh, health issues in the US, there was a paper that estimates about 20% of water quality issues come in from such issues. So do you wanna trade off resiliency and all of these for these issues? That's, I guess, part of the question that you will, you will answer as we go on. So now, as what makes water worse is that this system, as my colleague from Water Supplies Department said, they are hidden, they're underground. Uh, they are complex, they are large. In Hong Kong, 8,000 kilometers. I think in the Netherlands, more than 100,000 kilometers of pipes. In the US, they look at two million kilometers of pipes. The way we do checkups, we have to do checkups in these systems, cannot really, we cannot walk around to do checkups in a two million kilometer or 8,000 kilometer, which is underground. So the way that is done, if you can afford it, is often after a few years, you have to go back and take the pipes, put in new ones, and that cost us in Hong Kong 20 billions. In, U in US and China, if they need to do the same, the estimates is more than 300 billion US dollars, okay? So these are staggering. The question is, when we do those, do we learn from the past? Do we learn at least we can do them better next? So this is, you may not agree with me here, but I'm gonna pose it and I'm gonna challenge you. I reckon that this is where we are in all of the urban water systems. We essentially achieved the limit of what technology and science can do. I reckon if we really need to be this limit, we need a new revolutions, okay? And I think the reason if you are having a lot of tough time is because we are reaching this limit. Yes, we can invest, but the increments are gonna be very small. We need a new way of thinking. Like a new way of thinking, though, is gonna bring us low. It will eventually get us there, but it breaks the limit, and that's the cycle. In all of the things that we went through, uh, if you read books, that's the way we go. So 
I know maybe you don't like it, it's challenging, that's why we have a session afterwards and you could correct me. We are lucky though in this, most of the time we blame politicians. We say a politician, they are not giving us money, we want to do breakthrough research. But in this case it seems that governments everywhere are ready to invest in this problem. So I think we are working in a lucky area, we are lucky, so we need to take advantage of it. So for very quickly what we do, at least in, in Hong Kong, that fits in. Uh, this is uh, one of the research projects. And this is really, it wouldn't materialize without our close collaboration with the Water Supplies Department. Uh, this is again working together, managed to convince uh, the theme-based team that there is a worthwhile fundamental research to be done, but at the same time it could lead to potentially very exciting results. These are the other universities working with us. Uh, this is the team that we have, so again, international team uh, working with electrical engineers, mechanical, mathematicians, and so on. What do we want to do? I'm not going to go through details of this. Our hope is this, is we will do what doctors do when you, do, when you go for ultrasound. They set you on a table and they can look inside you and tell you what's going on. We are hoping to do that with underground in infrastructure. We're hoping to be able to image it. That is we're hoping to start to build the fundamental engineering and science that will one day hopefully get the engineer to be looking at their screen and they can look at their infrastructure and see what's going on. That's what our wish is. Uh, so I'll uh, skip this. Uh, and I just mentioned what I... To help us with this, we actually uh, built three, we have labs, we have labs in the university and some of our Dutch colleagues will come tomorrow and see the lab and see some of the things that I've uh, been uh, mentioning here. This is a lab in Italy to actually see, and sometimes we challenge each other, we, they send us blind tests and say, here, can you do this? Let's see how clever you are and so on. So it's, uh, it has been a good game. And then Gautau Kok, if you are driving by, you will see us spurting guara and so on. We are not wasting guara. Uh, we had uh, some challenges. People are scared sometimes, but that, it's us testing uh, some of these uh, technologies. This is also another unique working together. It's a WSD, HKUST uh, venture. They have this site here where they train uh, lots of their uh, technicians and engineers for leakage detection, the traditional ways. They allowed us to build the pipeline there so we can test what we are trying to, to do. Okay, so it's a, a nice uh, facility as well. Now, that's what we are doing. Now, our colleagues, and uh, especially Dr. Marian Blocker, she'll be talking to us about self-cleansing pipes, to, uh, how to improve it. She also has done research in drastic reduction in leaks and also in pipe replacement. She's not going to speak, I think, about those. Uh, but uh, her background, she is the principal uh, scientist in Kiowa Water Research, KWR. So I know, uh, not just the abbreviation, I know the name. Uh, Netherlands, uh, she got her PhD in 2010. She actually comes from a physics background, uh, an undergraduate, I believe, or master's, master's in applied physics. Uh, we're lucky to have her in the water field. And she has a number of uh, projects, so I will not take uh, any more of your time. So, Dr. Blacker, please. 